Hello and welcome to the British Library Food Season, which is generously supported by KitchenAid. My name is Angela Clutton. It is my complete delight to be the guest director of the Food Season, work with Polly Russell, who founded the season four years ago and is its curator. The Food Season is coming to you today from the frankly quite remarkable Le Manoir au Cassazon, just outside Oxford, because today's guest is the world-renowned chef Raymond Blanc, who's going to be talking to Felicity Cloak about his life and career and his latest book. Before we get stuck into all of that, just a little bit of housekeeping to get through. Um, you should be able to see on screen a few tabs. You'll be able to leave feedback about the event. You can find out more about our speakers and their books. You could head on social media to carry on the conversation. Or indeed, below this video, you can find where you can put in a question to join in and ask something of Raymond yourself. You might also want to leave a donation to support the work of the British Library. Now, to today's event. Raymond Blanc talking to award-winning food writer Felicity Gloke. I'll let Felicity introduce Raymond, but a few words about Felicity, who many of you will know from her How to Make the Perfect Column in the Guardian. She's written six cookbooks. Her most recent was a tour around France, making her the perfect person to speak to Raymond Blanc today. Over to you, Felicity. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, very special afternoon, British Library food season, talk, me, Felicity Cloak, and the amazing Raymond Blanc. Very quick introduction. Raymond has been described as the nation's favourite Frenchman. I am sure that he needs no introduction. But just to run through some of his achievements, which we'll come back to later, Raymond came to this country in the early 70s as a waiter speaking very little English. Somehow, not even a decade later, he had his own place. He had a Michelin star. Then he bought this fabulous country manor uh, just outside Oxford, the Manoir Quatre Saisons, which has held two Michelin stars for over 30 years, I think it's right in saying. Yes, He's very, done mathematics are good. Many, yes. many books. He has done many TV series. Um, he is just a superstar. He's got an OBE. He is a Chevalier de the Légion d'Honneur. He's, he's absolutely incredible. He's an institution, and he now has this new book, Simply Raymond, um, out. So he's uh, showing no signs of slowing down in any way, even though this year might have tested him and made him think about it. Um, so I want to say welcome, except that I'm in your manor, stroke manoir, Raymond. So thank you for having us. Thank you, Felicity, and welcome to Le Manoir. Thank okay. you. Um, first of all, just because <coughs> you, as I said, you have held Michelin stars for, for decades. So, you know, you cook at a very, very high level, sort of um, known for, as a face of very classic French cooking. But also, certainly in your books and your TV, you're a face of sort of accessible, like, French home cooking as well. I'm not sure, yes. And you're not, you're not from Paris, you're not from Lyon. Can you tell us a little bit about the area of France you're from and how that shaped your cooking? Delighted, of course. <laughs> uh, one this is my own interest, basically. One's, so. one's cradle, one will belongs to. And my, my little village was between the Jura Montaigne, the very rugged Jura Montaigne, and the hilly Burgundy, two big wine regions where the pig is a god, and we give to the pig more days than to the Virgin Mary. So that, gives <laughs> you tell you, that means food is that important. It's a beautiful, quiet village, very rural life, uh, hard life as well, but also very beautiful, which is a huge forest. We have here the biggest forest of Europe. Wow. Okay, so imagine for hunting and gathering the wild asparagus, the berries, the wild mushrooms, etc. It's a, it's a, it was, as a child, it was the best place to grow, the best. And did you, um, did you get involved with that as a child? That was part of, oh, very much part so. of the things that you did as a family? Very much so. No, not just as a family. The family, it was about garden, because we were poor. My papa, uh, we, had, we were five children, okay, and the garden would provide all of the food for all, all year round, okay, to the family. And that means, instead of playing football, my job, from the age of six, we were involved in the garden. Okay, whether it is hoeing, you know, between the rows, whether it is removing the stone, which seems to grow from that, from that earth, removing the grass, you know, uh, watering the plants, seeding. So I've learned so much, so much about seasonality, so much about varietals, so much about the magic of the little, seed, all brown and crinkly, 
and which can grow a beautiful plant, a beautiful, a, a beautiful carrot or beautiful spinach. It's amazing. So I've learned all these things, of course. And the forest, the forest offered the adventures, you know. And my papa actually had done a lovely magical map. Uh, that's his best present he ever gave me of where to get these specific wild mushrooms, where to get the wild asparagus, where to get those special berries, wild berries, and so on. So I was lucky to have a childhood which was pure, clean, uh, hard work as well, because a garden, and the garden was half of the size of Le Manoir, okay? So yeah. it was really a big garden, because as I said, it had to feed a family of seven, who are mm. seven of us, mm. okay? So I know about hard work, I understand so, so, you know, all these values that my parents gave me, and especially, of course, Maman Blanc, mm. and I'm sure you will want to touch... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, ...to ca quote, quote, catch up with mm. her in a moment. But mm. really, uh, that is... Since my childhood has created, and my mom have created the foundation, OK, of my simple philosophy about people, about food, about joie de vivre, about that magnificent table, which is the center, the very heart of the table. And I mean that, mm. okay? Not the bedroom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Just a I mean, we're French dealing with a Frenchman here, okay. so... <laughs> okay, so... Good to set the tone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you got... It must, when... But the table is a much bigger than that, mm. okay? Proper table, where every Sunday we would welcome 15, 16, mm. 20 friends, family, cousins, uncles, and it was special, mm. very special. And so that presumably was why was the roots of why you wanted to to have Le Manoir because you know you probably could have gone and opened I, a restaurant in London or whatever, but you wanted to have a sort of country house with a garden and a sort of potager type. I, I was not even thinking about it, uh, and I should have because uh, uh, my mum, uh, before she became mum and raised a family, she she was a farmer. A farmer's girl, a farmer's daughter. Mm. So working the soil, there was none of this machinery that you had before. You had to, to really. My grandfather, I saw him because I went with him with his two big Percheron horses. Mm. One would rest, one would work the soil. And I remember my father still, uh, you know, just uh, plowing okay, the field. And wow. actually, that was my first ride which I went on the back of this big, enormous horse. big, enormous horse. And I <laughs> kicked him, and he was, it was like an earthquake. <laughs> and when I met my first wife, she asked me, do you know how to ride him? I said, of course. <laughs> oh, God, I wish I didn't say that. Oh, my God. But um, it was a very pleasant life, mm. uh, very hard. You know, the house didn't have any water. My grandparents' house didn't mm. have any water. And, but it was beautiful to go in the well and get the water out of this well. Mm. Okay, there was no heating, but there was chimneys full of lovely fire and the smell of the mm. fire. So it was, it was really a, uh, an, it was an external adventure, but the foundation of who I am, mm. what I provide here, or at Brassi Blanc as well, because uh, we have a beautiful restaurant in Brassi Blanc, mm. and I'm very proud of it. Mm. And is there one, um, because I feel like this is, it's not a region of France that a lot of British people certainly are that familiar with. You know, we tend to stick to our little parts that you know, and you know, maybe the Côte d'Azur or the Alps or whatever, and you're not far from the Alps, but it's not quite there. Is there, if there was one speciality of your home region that you'd like people to try, what would it be? Oh my God, from my mum or from the region? From the region. Sausage de morteau. Okay, I, oh, I was yes, hoping you must. were going to say that because there's no, a recipe no, because in that Because for me, yeah. it tells you the whole of the gastronomy of my region. Imagine that region full of mountains, pine trees, les sapins, all over, billions of sapins. Of course, we would provide basically the smoking, okay, for the pig, okay, the, the cows would eat this extraordinary grass. I remember doing a TV program and I with my hands, the, the, the grass was cut. And it was so beautiful. There were so many flowers, mm. so many different uh, flowers, herbs as well. And I took it in my hand. And there was at least 50 different uh, uh, um, uh, grass mm. and flowers in my hands. Wow. So the biodiversity is there because the air is 
pew, it's called Squat Altitude. So imagine these cows, the Montbelliardes. Oh my God, they love it. So they munch his grass and they give his milk, which is the best, which creates the Comté, okay, which is a great cheese. Mm. Okay. And then, of course, they give the cheese. So the way is given to the pigs, to fatten the pigs. The, the forest is there to smoke the, the beautiful jambon, yeah. you know, and, and, and to smoke all the, in the tué, which were special chimneys. And every house, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, had a tué, which was in the house and would smoke all the, the belly of the pork yeah. or the, the rump, okay? So households Beautiful. would have their own yeah. pig in that, that And way. of course, we do one of the great specialities in my region is sausage de morteau. Mm. And that is truly the world best sausage. There is no other. So please find it. And to cook it is so simple. It is really just as it is. You smell it. It's, it's smoky, it's beautiful, not too much fat either. It's proper, but by, of course, appellation controlé, the proper sausage de morteau. It's fat, it's big, it's, it's gorgeous to look at. <laughs> and then you just simply put it in two liters of water. That's it. You don't need salt because it's cured, so you don't need salt. And you simmer it for about 20 minutes, turn it off, and you have a beautiful sausage de morceau that you can serve with a potato salad or just on its own in big, Fat slices. Oh my God, I feel funny. <laughs> I feel absolutely funny. I can't believe finished. you haven't cooked one for me to and try. Then, I'm very and then, disappointed. And of course, my mum told me, Raymond, you shall waste not. So that's what we're doing here. There's no waste, zero waste. Mm. And I mean zero waste, no landfill. There's a huge respect for food. Whether it's possible or here, there's an amazing amount. Of, that's where food starts. Okay? And then after with that water, where you cook that beautiful sausage, that you have card in front of your guests. Oh, good. Then you use the water, which becomes a wonderful soup. And you put a bit of cabbage, turnips, carrots, you know, and just, or potatoes sliced, and cook, cook it and serve the day after, the mm. day after, this wonderful soup. So the sausage of the you must, okay, unfortunately, and I don't understand why, it's incomprehensible because the flavor is quite incredible. That sausage de morteau is not in all the retailers, all over Great Britain, Britain and the world. Because it is the best and it's my I'm home. Gonna, I'm going to seek it out. That is the next thing I'm going to buy yeah, when I get back please. to London. I'm going to find it. Um, we've talked, you already mentioned um, your mother, who the book is dedicated to and has been an enormous influence on your life. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about her and how she shaped you? OK. First, my mum. Uh, my sons give you a little bit of flavor of my mom. Uh, she was one meter fifty, a very tiny little woman, and she kept shrinking as she got older. She, she died at 97 years of age, uh, not too long ago. Uh, and my sons call her Mother Teresa on speed. Okay, so, <laughs> so that gives you a little it's bit a of an picture. idea. Oh, what <laughs> a heart like that. Mm. My mom uh, would, would have kept for 27 years. She looked after a disabled young, very young person who had serious disabilities for 27 years. Wow. Amazing. So that's the kind of woman she loves to give. If she invites you in, your, in her home, you have to, have to have take that dish, eat that dish at least three times, because she starts crying. <laughs> okay? So she, she loved to give. She loved, she saw food as a medium, as this table, to provide joy, celebration, to bring people together, uh, and these values, I hold them so dearly, and I apply them every day. So she was a, a great cook, because she learns from her mother, Germaine, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> quite a character. I feel like the Small, story there. <laughs> that, uh, authoritative, but a greatest cook, the prefect or the ministers would call her to cook the food. Wow. Okay, so in Besançon. Mm. So an amazing, extraordinary, where, Understand, my, my grandfather lost everything. His farm, 40 cows, there was no insurance. So he, he became the keeper of a castle. And in that castle, it's a maison bourgeoise, there was a forest. There was 800 trees growing. Everything would grow. It was a microclimate, peaches, apricots. Oh, wow. Uh, absolutely, yes. Apricots, uh, wine. 
And my grandfather would grow everything, distillate everything. I got drunk at the age of five. <laughs> not because I wanted no. to. <laughs> I was there, I, they were distillating, you know, and when you mm. distillate, it's a lot of vapor of alcohol. And yeah. I saw this monstrous <laughs> thing which was called the alambic, yeah. where they would boil the, the fermented fruit and collect the, uh, the raw alcohol at 70 degrees. <laughs> and I came up and sees, I went down the mossy steps of the cellar, and I opened the big doors which were creaking, and I entered the shadowy world when I could see the men doing something and these big barrels of fermented bubbling fruit. And then I forgot, because <laughs> I was just breathing the alcohol. Yeah. And I remember my grandmother, right, I, you know, she saw me, <laughs> and she thought I drank wine or alcohol, yeah. and she gave me the biggest meeting that I've ever had. <laughs> I've done nothing And you never but drank breeze. again. <laughs> oh yes, of course. But what I want to say, food was really the heart of the house, was the, the the connection was, a, you know, around that table, there would be celebrations, there would be joy, there would be arguments, but the table was really a simple way to meet, mm. to, to connect us, to communicate, to, to be happy. Mm. And she, because you've never had any, right, I'm thinking that you never trained formally as a chef. Correct. It's just you came here with what your mother had taught you and what you'd sort of learned watching her and... And, sudden, and you got a Michelin star almost, you know, well, very quickly. I, yeah, I was uh, basically, uh, uh, so I, I didn't want to be, uh, I, I didn't even think of being a chef, and I don't know why, being steeped in this world, I should have been a chef from the age of seven, I should mm. I want to be a chef. But it never came to me, because, you know, girls were taught how to cook, not, not men. Mm -hmm. The men were the minions about chopping the vegetables, about uh, feeding the rabbits. It's a lovely story, please ask me. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. Uh, I was doing all this labor where the girls were taught how to cook because they would become the wives, would have a family and cook for the, for the home. Poor, poor girls. <laughs> what a destiny. <laughs> <laughs> you think about it. Thank God it has changed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, 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 and suddenly by the age of eight, uh, 17, uh, when I was destined to be an architect or a draftsman, and I hated squares, rectangulars, any form of geometric shape, and I loved anything which was asymmetric and, and fluent and arabesque-like, so I decided to stop. Then I became a nurse, but it didn't work out either. Because I, in a year, I saw 12 young people with leukemia who died, and I couldn't deal with it. Neither could I deal with the Catholic matrons, mm. which was a sister's mm. frightening sight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so, so obviously, uh, and then I fell in love with food much later, at 18 years of age, when I saw that restaurant in my hometown, uh, Place Granville, where Victor Hugo would sit. You know, our great writer would sit okay, uh, uh, in this enormous statue. And in that day, it was a beautiful summer day, and, and the guests were holding hands, saying, I love you, toujours, forever. Waiters were moving around, you know, just with their red, red, red Bordeaux jacket, with their silver epaulette. The maitre d'hôtel were flambéing, carving. I said, oh, my God, <laughs> oh, my God. There was this revelation, you know, I want to be the man who creates this food, not serve it, create it. But it never happened that way, you know, it never, seeing life is so, my Natalia is a wonderful way to say it. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> okay, so my plan is to become a great chef, the world best chef, and I told the boss, Monsieur, please do take me in your house. I will be the best, the best chef you ever had. So he looked at me, he listened to me, and then I got a job as a cleaner. <laughs> so, hey. I became the best cleaner in no time. Best, everything was shining, the mirrors. I would take my paper and my vinegar and I would shine, this, it was an 18th century house, so beautiful, big mirrors, and they were shining. The ladies' rooms were immaculate, it was like Versailles. <laughs> you know, everything was shiny, and they loved me because it was clean. Then I became a washer-up, then I became a glass washer-up. My glasses were all hand-blown, beautiful, and I, bought my own clothes so they didn't leave any fluff onto the glass. I would taste every glass of wine who came, just not to get drunk, to taste. In six months, I knew every single 
Vaughan, okay, whether it is Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, you know, whether it is, you know, Gamay. I knew all my grapes in six months. And meanwhile, I was cooking every night for my friends until three, four o'clock in the morning. I was full, I was dreaming about food. And I was, and then I became, so, and, and my glasses were beautiful and I cut down the breakage by half. So the boss loved me, the sommelier loved me. And then I became a waiter. That was a big moment in my life because I could at last come closer to the kitchen. And uh, that's when actually, <laughs> it's interesting, because it was my demise at the same time it was my, I realized that actually a great restaurant is, a, is a, an ensemble of individuals who are totally in love with what they're doing and they're good at it, and this ensemble of uh, gifted, passionate individuals can create magic and a memory which will last in your heart and your mind forever. And I mean that. Okay, so, and I was, so I was starting to cook flambéing, you know, and crepe Suzette and so on. And I was talking to the chef to tell him, and I was testing his food, it was a bit too rich, a bit too heavy. So I was telling him, say, chef, what about a bit of sabayon to light it, okay, or uh, more, more emulsion, less butter? <laughs> <laughs> he was a giant. And one day I saw him, his, his eyes got darker, he was a big man, his hands were about three times mine, his moustache bristled, you know, and uh, something was about to happen, he <laughs> did. And he took a, frying, a copper frying pan and smashed it into my face. And then after, I don't remember because I was in the hospital with a broken jaw, okay, and, uh, and uh, a few teeth out as well. Uh, and, uh, and then the boss actually, uh, told me off. I could hardly argue, it was a monologue. And at the end of it, he said to me, Raymond, I know you are going to be succeed, but not here. And he found me a place in England. That's how I came in England. He fled. Okay, exiled, <laughs> exiled from France. <laughs> but you see, in all bad things, there's always mm. a way to find a good, and of course, England has given me uh, home, my, my, my children are educated, have been educated here. I'm going to see my Olivier tonight. Okay, we're going to eat together, you know, uh, and my Sebastien. So, and, and really I discovered another culture, a new language, and my God, it took me some time. <laughs> Nobody could understand what I was talking about. <laughs> God, you know, even when I wanted, I came with my car, and I, I, I was asking, where is Oxford? You know, and they were looking at me, saying, well, what do you mean? <laughs> it, was, it was a language full of subtleties. Which had, I was good at German. I was always first German. I had done eight years of German first language. But English was difficult. But I love the culture. I must say, I love the culture. You have extraordinary qualities. You can laugh about yourself, not the French. <laughs> they, cannot, they cannot laugh about themselves. You, you, you can congratulate someone who says, just thrash you at tennis or at rugby or football. It's an amazing quality. Uh, you, you really have, um, you know, uh, you are, you are, you can listen to what other people speak. Of course, now I speak, okay, because you are the, I'm the interviewee and you are the interviewer. That's normal. But in France, everyone speaks at the same time as they listen. How can you do that? Around my table in France, even now, I get, you know, it's too much. Because how can you, can you, you know, if you try, if you try to speak together mm. and listen, it cannot work. Yeah. So I think my friend, British friends are quiet as well, reflective, much more. So I, mm. Uh, I love my France, of course, I love yeah. my France, but uh, England has brought me so much, and it's an open nation as well, which has brought me so much. I mean, because okay. you've been here almost 50 years, I couldn't believe hey, that. don't that egg just... it up, okay? 46, okay? <laughs> almost. Hey, come on, come on, Stephanie. Hey. It's just, it's just hey. extraordinary, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, this book, so this book, you're, there's a lot of your mother in the book, but yes. the book itself I think is quite a different book from the one that you set out, you thought that you would write at the beginning, is Very that true? So. So it, like true. everything else, it's sort of COVID Very much so, it's it. a COVID-led <laughs> book, so to speak. It's not a depressing book, you know, No, certainly not, there's a lot of joy, there's a lot of fun, there's a lot of generosity, energy in this book, I can assure you, and it's got the virtues to be unfussy, mm. simple, uh, and and uh, you don't need 20 chefs in your kitchens. There's no sous vide machines. It's just a, frying, a couple of frying pans, a few saucepans, and you start to cook your heart out. 
okay, in the simplistic way and extracting the, the beauty, the authenticity of that vegetable or that meat, okay, which has got to be free range or organic. That's the only part where basically the ingredient is the basics. Okay, that's what I was told. Okay, so anyway, so to come back uh, to, uh, to uh, this book was meant to be very different. It was, it, meant, it was meant to have a different title as well. It oh, was intriguing. meant cooking in 10 minutes because I had fallen in love uh, with a wonderful man, okay, uh, called uh, Edouard de Pomegne, uh, who lived between late, early, late 80s, eight, uh, 1800 and uh, what, 20th century, early 20th century. An amazing man, an amazing writer, whose book is still today one of the best seller. You know, he's lived through his, his decennies, and he had droopy moustache, he had uh, no naughty eyes, no <laughs> which was amazing man, okay, and I loved him. I loved his writing, uh, a beautiful writing, exquisite writing, and generosity. And he already saw way back in 1920 that the French, that life was different. People were spending less time, or her, people were spending less time at the table. What's going on? So he wrote a book, Please don't stop cooking. And he wrote a book, Cooking in 10 Minutes. Jamie yeah. Oliver, hey. nothing new under the sun. Absolutely. <laughs> so I wanted to write a book, not to compete with Jamie, because he did 30, 20, and suddenly Raymond Blondas 10. It was not about, <laughs> it was certainly not about, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do you call that, uh, copying. It mm. was uh, an idea which was very profound. Uh, about this man, okay, this gentleman who was a, a microbiologist at the Sorbonne, very educated professor, and uh, and and he wrote that book hundred years ago about you know um, cooking in ten minutes, and uh, and I and of course now when you think of the, what the supermarkets can provide between all salad washed off, cut, washed and so on, between mm. spinach and all the vegetables chopped and diced and so on, it, all the pre-sources being done, there's so many possibilities, mm. which before was a hard work to work in the kitchen, okay, uh, and, and uh, whereas, whereas now there's so many more possibilities to help the cook to have things you not know, done for him, okay, and uh, so, but, I stopped uh, cooking 10 minutes because suddenly that pandemic completely broke a cycle. A cycle where every British, more than the French, remember we invented the 35 hours a week uh, 30 years too early, <laughs> okay, which murdered our profession, which murdered the spirit of creativity, of entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and it really created big problem for us. Uh, so, 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 uh, so I'm just getting a bit lost at the <laughs> moment because I'm a bit all over the place. Uh, 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 so, 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 suddenly, the book I wanted to write didn't fit anymore the time because I knew it would change enormously. Beyond this pandemic, uh, the whole world, globalization would change. Would, I think, I believe strongly that we're going to make much more things ourselves. We're going to reinvent our agriculture. Instead of importing 70% of food, uh, we are going to grow at least 60 or 70% of it. We're going to reconnect with lost skills, either making a chef jacket or your beautiful uh, uh, deep purple pink uh, top here. We are going to make it here. I really believe that this is going to be a food revolution. Uh, obviously, environment is at the heart of this revolution. Okay, and I really uh, so I mean uh, there's going to be a rethinking, a reinventing of our lifestyle. Much more knowledge as well. Ignorance will replace uh, will be replaced by knowledge, and knowledge is empowering. And this little book is just telling you these simple, gorgeous little recipes which are unfussy, fun, and delicious, and don't take too much time. But also, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, a tiny statement of, of a big change in our lifestyles, in every part of our lives. And I find it exciting. I it's mean, a new adventure. It, yeah, it's very... It, it, 
there's a lot of focus on, um, I mean, there's some really indulgent recipes in there. And, you know, there's the saucisse de motto, there's important. a tartiflette, there's some lovely yeah. things in there. But also there's a, there's a lot of very light, healthy dishes. There's mm. some sort of... Um, uh, there's uh, um, ceviche, there's, um, yeah. you know, there's some curries, there's uh, lots, of, lots of different, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. so there's a bit there's of health, hundreds. yeah. There's hundreds of recipes, well, not hundreds, but at least 60% of these recipes are extremely light mm. and simple. For example, if you take, you know, again, goes back to my childhood, every Sunday, we would have crudité. What is crudité? It's an assemblage of different vegetables which are finely grated. And it's very important, not grated into, a, into large, chunky things. That's for animals, OK? <laughs> animals when and you British grate <laughs> finely a carrot, you extract the juice. So you, when you just put a bit of olive oil and vinegar, so what you need, or a bit of French dressing with mustard, you bind these juicy carrots, which have a wonderful texture, creating an amazing dish. And then you had celeriac, you had celeriac, you have tomatoes, you had, the, you had the, the, the cucumber, beetroots, and you had this area of colors and health and deliciousness. And you can just do, take one out and you've got a dish. Okay, and crudité was really a traditional French dish. It is what the roast beef is to England, no less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that is every Sunday. Yeah. And every Sunday, still today, crudité are very much offered in every French family. Mm. So it's a, yes, it's healthy food. Not trying, and, and we all know that uh, veganism, okay, is not a fashion. Uh, it's not uh, something which is going to disappear. It's about a lifestyle. It's about eating better. Mm -hmm. When we know that we have about 20 of, I don't know how much money, but billions of pounds spent on obesity, on cardiovascular disease, on, 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 on all sorts of, say, and, mis and 20 million pounds of misery. So we have to eat better. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's joyful. And I really believe that nutrition, okay, nourish is the best nourishment. And, and doesn't, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't fight with good food. Mm -hmm. Good food and good nourishment and good nutrition can be achieved. And that's wonderful that we can rediscover at last the beauty, the magic of pulses, of herbs, of spices, of, 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 of seeds, of, of and vegetables and salads. Mm. Because they can create amazing dishes. And I hate to call it vegan or vegetarian or pescatarian because it's just good food, but we are going to reinvent a, a great deal uh, the way we eat, uh, understand it better. And I think that modern consumer today, and, the, and all the guests who read this beautiful little book here, <laughs> Simply Raymond, will also, this consumer yeah. is much more knowledgeable, much more aware, much more inquisitive. Mm. They want to know what is in that food. How much chemicals? Which mm. chemicals? Mm. Where does it come from? You know, at each time, for example, what makes me happy? Okay, very happy. You know, there was a, there is a business called uh, Apples and Pear, which has created a movement, which is a national movement. And instead of eating f f apples coming from New Zealand, from South Africa, millions of miles away, America, etc. A few from France as well, but it's not too far. <laughs> no, it's almost local. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so effectively, um, see, imagine what it means if you translate that. That means this food is grown thousands of miles away. Lots of chemicals in, in, into it. Then they put into chamber, deprive them of oxygen, and shift them here, travel them. So pollution in growing it, pollution through travel. And then what is the benefit for us? Why don't we grow our own food? And, and this year, and that makes me very happy, apples and pears in Great Britain have gathered all the great growers, okay, of, of the best regions of France, Kent, Okay, I'm sure and so on, so on, all <laughs> over. And all these growers, British growers, are providing now all the, many, at least f more than half of the foods grown by artisans in England, in Great Britain, and that's exciting. I find that exciting. And that's the kind of mm. change, because we will, pollution is really, uh, you know, for me, my mom taught me seasonality. Mm. And for me, seasonality is very simple. 
is so much more than that. Seasonality means close to home, your home, my supplies. Mm. So if it's seasonal, it's close to home, better taste, mm. better textures, Cheaper, better colors, often. better nutrients. Yeah. Then you, don't, you help your farmer to keep his farm. You help your little village to keep its post office, its own local pub. Mm. Then seasonality means you don't import food from millions of miles away, creating pollution by growing it, and then by cleaning up the pollution. Okay, so, and then, of course, the best part of it, you just said it, when it's seasonal, you have the first strawberries, the first asparagus. Then when you pass this first, when they get, there's a plenty of food, there's an extraordinary uh, amount, so there's a glut, and then it's half of the price. Mm -hmm. and, so, and the taste is mm. absolutely at its best. So I've got maybe a little, yes, uh, I would love to, uh, and people to apply these values because they make sense. They really make a great deal of sense to wait for your strawberry. Your French strawberry come first, <laughs> the Gariguette, and then the English strawberries yeah. come a little bit after. Okay, and I wish you could all apply these values because it makes mm. sense. Mm. It really makes sense. And I really see British agriculture importing less and growing more mm. of our own. And not just food, as I think about mm. everything else. Mm. And that globalization is going to be a different, it's going to be a game changer because we realize that uh, keeping our environment cleaner is crucial, is really, is a nucleus, is a, is a very heart of change, mm. political. And you can see luxury is going to change dramatically as well. Before luxury was careless. Mm. It was just, didn't, didn't have any rules. It will be just about the outside. Now we are thinking about inside. Mm. Big difference. Do you think, and do you think that uh, um, these changes have been accelerated by the last 12 months and that's yes. making me pe people think more yeah, about that? Very because much you, you yourself, I think, had COVID quite badly and that, that has maybe changed your outlook as well. Has that made you change the way you eat? Or Yes, it was a very mm. severe COVID where mm. actually I was in hospital for a month at the, oh. uh, in the local hospital. Mm. At least, again, I'm local. Yeah. <laughs> okay, at the John Radcliffe, okay, mm. led by, uh, I was uh, at the high dependency unit, uh, and, and it was uh, very, and there I completely admired the excellence of the service, the care uh, of these amazing professionals, these nurses, these doctors, and uh, that, yes, and then when you really don't know the outcome, okay, you realize how fragile life is. And, and yes, it will have an impact on my life, there's no doubt mm. about it. In so much that uh, I will do a bit less because I'm still running at 200 miles an hour. Mm. <laughs> uh, and I will start to delegate a bit more because I've got amazing field marshals, generals, great chefs, you know, great managers. So I don't have to do everything. Mm. And that means it's a great lesson of humility and also a great lesson where I hopefully will learn a great deal about managing my life better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to do just as well, you know, and selecting a bit more mm. where you want to be. Mm. Um, I forgot to say that we're going to have questions in about um, five minutes. Um, please submit your questions, Raymond. I've got a few more which I'm going to monopolise him with, but please do send them in and I'll ask as many as possible um, in about five minutes. So get going with the questions, please. Um, did you, did you, when, when you had COVID, did you lose your sense of taste? Because that, as a chef, I, I just cannot imagine yeah. it. I mean, as a normal person, that sounds like torture, but did, was it that was affected? amazing because I, I, I had 41 degree fever. 90% of my lungs were burned, oh, wow. infected. I could breathe only from here. Uh, uh, it was really uh, pretty nasty, but I never oh. lost my taste, neither <laughs> my sense of smell. And, and for that, I'm grateful. Mm. Also, when you are eating hospital food, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> sometimes I wish I'd... But they were, they were brilliant because uh, I understand, you know, when you cook food at Le Manoir, or Bassi Blanc for that matter, it's, I understand so how hard it is to cook, you know, for 100 guests or 70 guests. There, see, chefs are cooking for 25,000 people, including the staff, you know, there's a huge hospital. So, little budgets. Okay, so I was grateful and I was enjoying my food because food, whatever, however it came, 
um, it was really about nourishment, about calories, mm. about proteins, all the building blocks for you to, li to live, to smile again and start walking and breathing, etc. So I was very grateful to them. Actually, the, the best was custard. Oh, you must go to the hospital. You've got the best custard, okay, with frozen plums, but it's delicious, okay. And sago was excellent, you know. Oh, interesting. Uh, so there were some very good dishes. You're almost making it sound so uh, I don't perfect. recommend no. the pork, okay? okay? Because the pork said, you know, pork shop. Oh my God! <laughs> and I was imagining a pork shop, you know, beautifully rissole in foaming <laughs> butter, you know, and beautifully gold, yeah. and you would deglaze with a bit yeah. of water because in his book he doesn't use stocks, yeah. just water. Mm. My mum would never use stocks. She would extract the best flavors and textures from with water, extracting it from the vegetables, the meat, or the fish. Okay. Uh, and and I was I was I was dreaming of that pork shop, you know, <laughs> all gold and caramelized. <laughs> and oh, it no. came, it came. I got, it was beige. <laughs> it was minced meat of some sort. <laughs> oh no, I mean, really, that was one of the great <laughs> despairing moments, okay, in my Bring hospital Bring on the custard. <laughs> but I still ate it because you still yeah. want to eat because it's about yeah. still. And and I and I understand the. Uh, the nightmare that these chefs have to cook for so mm. many people with so little money. Mm. And that's why yeah. basically many people who have tried you know, to, uh, to change yeah. hospital food has failed because simply the cost, the cheap cost. Mm. And that's a great shame. And I, uh, here I'm going to invite all the team of the High Dependency Unit Aww. in Oxford to say just thank you. Aww. All the nurses, all the caterer, and it's all going to happen now, uh, just because yeah. I was, you know, I work in the world of excellence. When you see in another craft, whether it is filming or interviewing or, or being a nurse or, or a consultant or a doctor, and you see excellence, oh my God, it's so touching, it is so beautiful. Are you going to put pork chops on the menu? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my pork chops. Just well, <laughs> pork chops are always a little bit of a, you know, there's, a, there's plenty of good yeah. vegetable dishes here. Mm, yeah, no, and it's pulses, very vegetable and, heavy. And, and 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 seeds, so, yeah, it's a lot about the vegetables. Um, I've got so much to ask you, but I feel like I need to give other people a chance, a chance. to ask. Yes. But before, I'm going to change my, what may be my final question, because you asked me to ask you about the rabbit. And I love, <laughs> I love rabbits both running around and eating. So please tell me your story, oh, which God. I suspect. Involves oh both that's forms a, of rabbits. That's a, a story <laughs> which is going to be sanctioned with a, um, how do you call that one? It's in forbidden, a forbidden story. Oh, okay. Is it? Oh, but it's I not... will say it because it's okay. forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what's happening is um, my mum, you know, uh, we would eat meat only twice a week. All the rest would be mm. vegetables, pulses, etc. And part of uh, once a month we would have rabbit and the rabbit I, ch I went to get the food in the in the, in the forest around all the beautiful uh, herbs they liked and my mom would talk to her rabbits she loved the rabbits and every month or every two weeks we would kill a rabbit so i would kill the rabbit okay because mm -hmm. there's no hypocrisy in france no mm -hmm. you know i fed you for a whole two or three months now, okay, you feed the table, okay? Mm. And uh, so I would kill the rabbit, peel the fur, remove, remove the heart, remove the kidney, you know, put it on the side, chop the rabbit in pieces, mm. and give it on a beautiful dish for my mum to apply her art. Art, no, not heart. <laughs> okay, uh, just in case if you yeah. okay, see what's going on here. <laughs> okay, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then, then she would mustard it, season it, slightly flour it, and in, in a little bit of oil to start with, then butter. She would golden every piece mm -hmm. of it, and then put it in the oven with tarragon, with onions, with garlic, with thyme, bay leaf. And then after half an hour, she would deglaze a bit of water for acidity, and then water to finish, to create a jus, oh, to die for. <laughs> So then when it came to eating, so imagine the five kids and the two parents, and my mom be, being there, and I would always be across my papa and my mama, okay? And she was eating the rabbit, at the same time she was, she was, actually same time she was eating it, 
she was smiling at the same time as she was crying. Oh. And that's called a French paradox. <laughs> <laughs> I will always remember those moments. Oh dear, bless her, my beautiful mum. But you know, it's so, it's so incredible, yes. isn't it? She loves the flesh mm. of rabbits, you know, mm. but she also loves the rabbits. Yeah. That's <laughs> Sorry. very sweet. But it's very cruel. I think the that's recipe is in I put, here. I didn't put rabbit. Yeah. That's why I didn't put rabbit, yeah. because I know you look rabbits as a pet. Well, I like we eating don't. them as well, but. <laughs> we <yeah>. don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll put, uh, so in here is it with chicken? Is that, so yeah. it's chicken done the same yeah. way because you I didn't yeah. want to make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> Always think. Okay, let's go for some some audience questions. Um, Sarah would like to know what your favourite meal is, which I imagine is quite a hard one. Yes, because whether you in uh, Southeast Asia or wherever, or at my home or in the south of France, it will be different. You know, uh, if I'm in the south of France, probably it will be a, a beautiful bouillabaisse, you know, full of sun with a, mm. uh, or, or, or wonderful ratatouille, which I actually give a very, very fast recipe mm. here, very fast. And of course, in the ratatouille, it's a building block to bring spices, cumin, caraway, or, or, or beautiful curry. You know, there's so many flavors and you can pour a piece, or you can pour for a piece of fish on it. So immediately, imagine a, a single recipe can bring so many ideas. So according to where you are, but if I had to choose really Swedish is it's very difficult because of course there's the seasons, which also comes in, uh, but, uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult, it's you, no, I'm you not very good you at thing, him, one Sarah. thing, but I love him. all, I've been taught to eat all food and I enjoy all food uh, because I've traveled the world and I've eaten some extraordinary things. So, but what I would prefer probably is the first of everything, of anything. Like the first asparagus coming from mm. Wales, the Y Valley. You know, mm. all the simple dressing, you know, mm. or a bit of Hollande sauce if you feel rich, okay. Mm. Uh, or grilled if you want, you blend them and grill them, okay. Uh, or the first peas, you know, that mm. you barely cook, you just put a bit of water, how to cook your vegetables. Oh my God, please don't murder them in boiling water and so on. <laughs> no, all your vegetables, you can prepare them in advance, Okay, and you put your spinach leaves or your peas or pea, with the pea shoots, whatever it is, with a round of the peas, please don't throw them away, do a lovely soup, uh, pour them and puree them, and you've got, an, strain them, you've got an extraordinary soup. Okay, so don't, um, and, and with water and no stocks, please, okay. Um, so, so yes, the first thing of everything is the first baby lamb now, which is now so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which is coming yeah. from 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 a uh, uh, right in the south, uh, which is uh, uh, not Wales. Dorset. Dorset, yes, mm. Dorset. Now the Dorset lamb is on, but it's better to eat lamb when it's got more maturity. Mm. There's more flavour. There's more texture. It's more fat. Okay, but usually the most, you know, the first jersey new potatoes. For me, it's a feast. Mm. It's an extraordinary celebration of a particular moment, when his first proper jersey potatoes. Oh my God, the flavour is amazing. <laughs> so the first of anything, whatever it that's might a, be. That's a good answer. Yeah. Um, Rachel would like to know, um, I think maybe we already touched on this, but she said that you grow so many beautiful herbs and vegetables. What's your favourite herb and what's your favourite vegetable? She says her guess is peas and lemon verbena. I love both, yes, but it's about vegetables and herbs. My favourite yeah. herb, uh, actually my favourite uh, uh, herb is more likely to be uh, basilic. Okay. Okay, because I really love, and basil, you can grow it anywhere. Mm. Think of a window seal inside your home if you don't have a garden. Uh, you know, it's delicious, it's beautiful, uh, uh, wonderful perfume as well. And if you want to make your pesto, so if you cannot grow it yourself, go to supermarkets, you eat a big bunch of, uh, of uh, basilic, blanch it in full boiling water for three seconds, maybe one, no, no, one second only, to fixate the chlorophyll, mm. okay? So you remove some of the flavor, but because the flavor is so rich, you know, you don't need all that flavor. Mm -hmm. So blanch it and that fixates the chlorophyll. That means your pesto will remain against a big war between Italy mm -hmm. and France. The French say they created pistou, mm -hmm. and the Italians saying they created pesto, and we're still fighting for it. <laughs> we never know who <laughs> created it, but probably the French. Okay, with France. <laughs> Present okay. company. So you, you have your, you, so you boil it, once again, put in, in cold water. 
Squeeze it in the liquidizer with olive oil, a bit of parmigiano if you want to, okay, and, and olive oil and puree it. And you have something you can keep for a whole 10 days in your fridge and add to a soup or mm. add to a sauce. Mm. It's amazing. You are simply, and that is about simplicity. This book, this distillation, remove all the myths and the complication of food and try to go at the heart of simplicity as much as possible. So, what was the question? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so basil <laughs> and your favorite vegetable. Yeah. For, oh, my favorite vegetable. Oh, I love celeriac, and I've done two, three, three recipes. One, uh, remoulade of celery, which mm. is uh, just celeriac with a bit of mayonnaise. Mm. And now, remember, you can do your mayonnaise with chickpeas, removing the eggs, so it can be completely vegan. Okay, because in the, in the chickpea water, you have a natural protein, okay, which will bound, bound the oil. It's amazing it's how our life is. It's magic, all these <laughs> discoveries. No, so yes. Uh, I never thought I'd hear a French chef recommending aquafaba mayonnaise. Well, <laughs> it's delicious. It's very good. It's yep. slightly different. There's less richness, but it's beautiful mm. flavor and clean. Okay, and of course you will have chive inside, and and so celeriac for me is a beautiful grated or pan fried any vegetable with sugar like fennel. You know, you, a big chunk of fennel. Next time you you cut it by half. Okay, and then blanch it in a little bit of water, that's all. Then remove the water out and pan fry it in olive oil or a little bit of butter. Oh, the sugar helps the perfect caramelization. And you have a vegetable which is just to die for. You know, our celeriac is the mm. same. I've done tartata celeriac, a pie celeriac, you know, a big chunk of celeriac, mm. you cut it. The problem is spilling it. It's just a, yeah. it's just, and that's what I would like to make a point, that basically, Cooking, there's an element of work, okay? So most of the recipe is basically about 10, 15 minutes preparation, mm -hmm. uh, 20 minutes, and, but it's an, well, 10 minutes preparation, really roughly, 10 to 15 minutes. So it's a very, it's relatively, it's not 10 minutes anymore, because <laughs> we, we knew mm -hmm. we were moving to a different world. Uh, so, so celeriac definitely, either grated, Please, you must and put a bit of lemon juice because it will oxidize. The lemon juice will also be a catalyst of flavor and will keep your celeriac as well nice and white. Okay? And then, so a, a bit of mayonnaise and a bit of chicory around and or whatever you wish, a rocket, whatever, a bit of color. Uh, and then you have a dish, okay? Uh, and and pan, pan, to pan fry it, yes, slowly from raw, you cut it across and pan fry it. Okay, in big chunks or in big chips, you know. Okay, mm. pan fried in foaming butter or olive oil as you wish. And it is a few walnuts at the end. Or is the, <laughs> and that's it, that's it. You know, it's like sweet potatoes, mm. they're so delicious. Mm. They cook so fast as mm. well. And there's a high level of sugar as well. So mm. be gentle, not fast, otherwise you're going to hate me. And, uh, and sorry, it's not my fault. Because if you go a high temperature, sure, you've got a faster browning, but you also, you want a slow browning to extract all the juices mm. and come, oh, God. Oh, you're making I feel me hungry. Finished. Yeah, you're making me Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Um, Nicola says, is it possible to have a sustainably sourced organic diet on a low income? It's more difficult, but it's possible. And of course, you've got to think of your health. So that means your protein, the mix of uh, vegetables you need to have in order to have the maximum protein and that's crucially important. And pulses, vegetables, herbs, spices can really create, yes, beautiful meal. But for me, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nutritionist, mm. uh, but I'm interested, very strongly interested in, in nutrition, okay? And my partner has got a, a doctor and she got a master in nutrition and she's a Raymond Blanc Cook School, um, you know, uh, uh, nutritionist. Okay, so, uh, uh, what was the question, sorry? <laughs> Is it possible to have yeah. a sustainable organic diet yes. on a low income? Yeah, but it's, it's going to be a bit more, because we all know if you buy organic, it's 20% or 30% more, okay? But you, you have to, to, to organize your week eating where you have, you know, it's, 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 it's pre preparing yourself to have more vegetables, more pulses, for God's sake. Lentils are de delicious. I've got a dal uh, soup, okay, which comes from, uh, from Asia, okay? So easy to prepare. 
and you've got wonderful flavors from elsewhere as well. And your pulses will provide this kind of protein that you need. You know, when, I, when my Natalia cooks me, you know, uh, a beautiful broad beans with some of these cheesy broad beans. No, I say, it is a delicious dish. Just mm. olive oil, a bit of water. You bring it to the bowl, a bit of garlic, of course, always garlic is always, slide <laughs> it in, okay, it's a bowl of nutrition, okay, a bit of salt, tiny bit of salt, you can always add, you cannot take away, salt, the pepper, cover, full on, okay, and you put a few leaves, okay, and a tiny bit of parmesan or comté cheese at the end, and you have a dish which can cook in five or six minutes. Mm. And it is nutritious, and it is lovely, and at the end of the day, it's exactly what you want, you don't want, when you add the opera here every day and you taste layered food, you know, which has got a richness in terms of taste and textures, when you come home, you want total simplicity. And sometimes a very simple meal can be absolutely delicious, but you need mm. to also get to know about... Um, uh, so organic, maybe bio... Is a, yes, there's always a cost element okay, attached to organic. But I would recommend it because it doesn't use pesticide fertilizers. It's clean, okay, it's clean growing. And I think that for me is the biggest value you can possibly get. Mm. Okay, yeah. Okay, I think it's probably be our last question. And I'm really sorry because Raymond is such a great chatter and because I'm so nosy, we didn't get to all of your questions and I'm really sorry. Um, it's all your fault, Felicity. It's my, yeah, I, I will take all the blame. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> But um, someone I'd like to know, regarding reopening for business, and I'm guessing both here and at the brasseries, I don't know if the brasseries are already open, what are you most looking forward to? Well, it's life into a, a place which is at the moment dead. Uh, so to bring back life, of, we're training already our teams at the moment. So there's already this excitement of reopening your place. Hear the laughter of your friends, of your guests. Okay, in your house, whether it is Bois Blanc or Manoir, or anywhere in the world. It's exciting, it's wonderful to, to have that joie de vivre back, okay, and hear the chatter and the wonderful food, you know, created by these fantastic chefs, you know, and to be delivered by, you know, there's something magical. And we, that's what we miss the most, I mm. believe, besides traveling, eating out, because when you eat every day, and I know, Every one of these recipes, most of, well, not everyone, but 90% of the recipes is well, during the pandemic and, and I was cooking my heart out, mm. okay, and sometimes filming myself, <laughs> it was <laughs> a bit more complicated. Uh, but I think, uh, yes, to hear that laughter, to hear that joie de vivre back again, uh, and for the friends we have not seen for a long time, to be able to reconnect with themselves, with each other, I think this is something which is so special, so so magical. That's why I'm a chef. Mm. It's, it's providing magic in the garden, in the food, in the service, in the generosity of the service, not to create a French nose bag which nobody wants, but a place of joy, of total celebration. And I think we're going to get that very, very soon. It's exciting. Uh, I feel so excited about it. In fact, I remember that there is one question I'm going to sneak in. You mentioned your broad, the, the broad beans and the cheese that sometimes you have after the end of service. And you said that your partner often serves it to you with a joke yeah. served on the side. Would you be able to tell us all a joke to finish with? Well, she will measure immediately when I come back. <laughs> you know, she will, look, she will you know, look at me and say, oh my God, <laughs> he's not in a good mood tonight. <laughs> he has a problem. Uh, and she would immediately come out. Uh, she, she has got a, an amazing sense of humor. And of course, yes, uh, uh, and she would crack a joke. Uh, I, I cannot tell you one now. I told you one just a moment ago about, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. is is kind of a little snippets of, uh, which is okay. one of the favorite. But, she, but I'm sorry, I cannot oh. respond to you, but oh. I will send you to you. Okay. <laughs> The next but, book's but going to be the Raymond Blanc joke book. It's a conversation. Yeah. She, she has humour. She has, she has this, uh, um, <coughs> She will always find a way to make you smile, to to make you relax. Uh, she's a great conversationist as well. So I'm a very lucky man. Very lucky man. Thank you so much, Raymond. That's been brilliant. And she Sorry. cooks for me as well. And I would never tell her food is bad. <laughs> never. <laughs> I'm in big trouble. I should think not. <laughs> no, exactly. You know. 
<laughs> yeah, appreciate it. It's been really cool for you. you know? Yes, indeed. Thank you so much to Raymond. This has been a brilliant chat. I'm sorry we didn't have longer. Sorry to everyone whose questions we didn't get round to. Um, that was brilliant. Please, this book is such a lovely, lovely book. Genuinely, um, go out and buy it. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thank you, very Thank much, you to everyone. Merci. Ça. Bonne journée. À bientôt, Manoir. Merci, Blanc. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raymond on Felicity. That was completely incredible. What a treat to hear you both talking together. Thank you so much. And thank you so much too to KitchenAid who support the work of the food season. You might like to enter a competition for KitchenAid to win a set of their cordless kit, place on the virtual cooking class, or um, also Callum Franklin's cookbook, The Pie Room. Loads more to come from the food season. We're here right through into the end of May. If eminent chefs are your thing, you should be able to enjoy the films we've made with Claudia Rodin, Elizabeth Luard, Olya Hercules. They're showing on the Friday afternoons. It's all there on the British Library website. Take a look. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for joining us at the British Library food season.